Welcome to From Remembrance to Independence, Behind the Scenes of Israel's Founding, Toldo Israel's virtual Israel Remembrance Day and Independence Day program. Before we begin, I want to give special thanks to our partner, the Rabbinical Council of America, and our sponsors who have made this program possible. Tova and Howard Weiser, and Iris and Shalom Maidenbaum. Over the last several years, Toldot Israel has interviewed more than 1,200 men and women from Israel's founding generation. We have recorded the stories of members of all of the era's underground movements, soldiers of all ranks and decoration who fought in Israel's War of Independence, Holocaust survivors, Jews from Arab lands, volunteers from the West, and native-born Israelis. We've interviewed nurses, school teachers, cultural figures, journalists, and diplomats, and pioneers in science, technology, and agriculture. We have built an archive housed in the National Library of Israel that will serve as a resource for academics, educators, and the general public to learn about the state of Israel from the people who built it. Our program begins by marking Yom HaZikaron and honoring the memory of the nearly 24,000 soldiers that have fallen in defense of the State of Israel. Sal Baskin was a ranking officer in both the American and Israeli armies who was awarded two silver stars, the bronze star, and two purple hearts by the United States Army. In his account of the devastating battle in Fallujah, we will revisit the sacrifices that brought the State of Israel into being. I arrived in Israel on the first ship that there was no blockade. We had a little ship with potatoes. And under the potatoes, we had Spanish Hispano 20 millimeter guns, new guns with grease. New stuff, no, Alta Sheikh, Alta Zaha. Finally got new stuff. And we got the guns. And then they sent me to the north, to Panmach, the same day. And then he sent me the Pruga Dalit, and then I finally took over Pruga Gimel, the Pruga Datit. And then I finally ended off as being a battalion commander of Yechidat Siyu Sheva. We got involved with the Battle of Fallujah. We had a certain amount of chutzpah that we should not have had. And when I saw the plans, I knew it was very, very chancy. We had 400 fighters. The Egyptian brigade consisted of almost 3,000 men, and it was raining all the time, and the troops were tired. And then we were ordered to attack. Pluga Aleph, Osata Pritza, made the break. Pluga Bet, I heard my cousin saying that the Kval Kmat Beyadenu, they already had prisoners. And Pluga Gimel was supposed to go up the tell and take over the tell where they had the Vickers guns, the, the Egyptians were using that as a base. And suddenly I got an order to go all the way around to Bechabrin because the situation was deteriorating. And it did. By the time I got there, on the other end, the battle is over. I went in with my, a couple of jeeps. Who got bad, my cousin, got wounded again and my second in command that I sent was killed. Otherwise, he had another one or two other wounded, wounded or killed, I don't know. And Pluga Gimen, the religious company, got the brunt, and only 14 escaped. Never realized that there was no soldiers between us and Bet Romano, Bet Tel Aviv, that was the headquarters. There was nobody because the rest of them were fighting in El Arish and all the other places. We stretched ourselves thin to the point. So I was basically the only koach left. This is the sum total of the active fighting in the War of Independence. The advantage that the Arabs had against us with the meager equipment makes me think that there was a fickle finger of chance, or the chance of the finger of God that saw us through. The date for Yom HaZikaron was chosen to commemorate the tragic fall of Kibbutz Kfar on the 4th of Iyar, 
May 13, 1948, the day before Israel's independence was declared. The powerful pairing of the solemnity of Yom HaZikaron with the joy of Yom HaTzma'ut follows a long Jewish tradition. We observe the fast of Esther before Purim, and the fast of the firstborn precedes Pesach. The elements of sadness and struggle are thus linked to our triumphs, victories, and celebrations. The events that led to the fall of Gush Etzion began a few months earlier, in January 1948. 35 young soldiers set out from Jerusalem to bring much needed supplies to the besieged Etzion block south of the city. They never reached their destination. The soldiers were ambushed en route, and despite fighting valiantly, the entire company was killed. In his eulogy for them, David Ben-Gurion said, I don't know if there was any company in the Israel Defense Forces or in any army in the world that assembled such splendid manpower, pure bravery, and spiritual abundance as this company, who will forever be known by our people as the Lamed Hay, the 35. These lions of Israel were a mix of youthful spirit and glory, superior wisdom, and bravery fiercer than death. Between 1943 and 1947, four kibbutzim were established in Gush Etzion, the Etzion block, on land purchased by the Jewish National Fund and private Jewish businessmen. Located on the road between Jerusalem and Hebron, these new farming communities served to bolster Jerusalem from the south. <laughs> On November 29, 1947, the United Nations voted that with the termination of the British mandate, Palestine would be partitioned between its Arab and Jewish residents. The Etzion bloc fell within the borders of the proposed Arab state. The very next day, local Arab militants began attacking Jewish settlements, including the Etzion bloc. At dawn on January 14, 1948, hundreds of Arabs under the command of Abd al-Qadr Husseini attacked the Etzion bloc communities. It's the largest battle yet in Israel's War of Independence. While they succeed in defending the Etzion bloc, the Jewish fighters find themselves dangerously low on ammunition and without medical supplies to treat the wounded. Husseini's men control the only road into the bloc. The Haganah decides to send former Etzion bloc commander Dani Mas with reinforcements by foot to Kfar Etzion to replenish its arsenal and medical supplies. Forty men are recruited. No. 
להפך. כולם, כולל אני, היה ברור שבעוצמת אש כמו שאנחנו נסענו איתנו, אנחנו נפרוץ כל ניסיון לחסום אותם. The first attempt to reach the Etzion block via Jerusalem fails. The forces decide to approach the block from another direction, this time from the west, despite the fact that this route is 17 miles long and passes by several Arab villages. <laughs> Departure is scheduled for 9 p.m., but the unit is delayed awaiting the delivery of weapons. As they prepare to leave, Dani Mas discovers that there are not enough rifles for two of his soldiers and orders them to stay behind. Only at 11.15 p.m. is the unit finally ready to leave. There's a danger they will not be able to reach their objective under cover of darkness. בחושך, לא באור. ברגע שנגמר הלילה, ו... ומספיק מספר קטן מאוד של צלפים שאנחנו לא יכולים לזוז. אמרתי לדני, אתה יודע מה, אתה נמצא בשטח השיפוט שלי, אני פוקד עליך להישאר הלילה פה. התחיל לצחוק. אמר לי, בכוח תוכל להחזיק אותי. הוא פחד לגורלו של כפר יציאה. והוא אמר בליבו, יכבשו מחר ביום ויהרסו את כפר עציון וירצחו את התושבים. ומה אני אגיד שבתשע, עם הנשק שהיה לי, לא יכולתי להגיע לכפר עציון? ראיתי שעם הבחור הזה אני לא אוכל לצאת ראש. וחבל על כל דקה מיותרת. יצאו 38 בחורים והם הלכו. אני הייתי בעשירייה האחרונה. ההליכה הייתה לא קלה בגלל המשקל. באחד הקטעים בדרך אני החלקתי על אבן או סלע ונקעה לי הרגל הימנית. ניגש אליי דוד צרדנר, הוא היה חובש, וניסה עם שני משולשים לקשור את הקרסול לנעל. אז דני החליט שזהו זה. ואמר לי לקחת אותו, קרא לי אליו ואמר, אתה תיקח את הבחור הזה והזה חזרה. התגובה שלי הייתה, למה דווקא אני, במילים אחרות, אבל למה דווקא אני? אז הוא הסביר לי, כי זו תגודה. האמת היא שפחדתי. אני חושב שגם האחרים פחדו. גם אורי וגם ישראל, אבל אני פחדתי. כי הרגשתי יותר בטוח עם הקבוצה, עם המחלקה. אורי גביש ומשה חזן, יחד איתי אנחנו חזרנו להר טוב. המחלקה למעשה דאגה יותר לנו מאשר לעצמה. באותו לילה, אני, חצי הלילה, אני שמרתי וחיכיתי להם שיבואו. לקחתי כמה אנשים והלכנו לקראתם. איזה... כמה קילומטרים. אני כל הלילה הוטטתי להם פרוז'קטור לכיוון המערב, כדי שתהיה להם אוריינטציה לאן לבוא. וכבר העיר הבוקר, ועדיין חיכינו להם, וחיכינו וחיכינו, ולא כלום. אני הרכבתי את האוזניות, ואני שומע צהלות שמחה בערבית. דבחנהום, מטלנהום, הרגנו אותם, שחטנו אותם, ערפנו אותם. יליל, יליל, זה, זה, ומברוק, וברכות, ומדווחים למפקדה. אז אני יורד למטה, מפקד המחוז, אני אומר לו, תשמע, מה, משהו קורה באזור הזה, 
בית פג'ל זה בגוש עציון בשעה כזאת, מה, מה קורה שם? הם צוהלים שנהרגו, הם הורגו לנו שם. אומרים עשרות, עשרות. אוי ואבוי, אומר. אני פוחד שזו המחליקה של הסטודנטים שלנו. אף אחד לא ידע בדיוק מי נהרג, מי נהרג, כמה נהרגו. כולם, חלק. יצאנו במטוס, כאשר הגענו לסביבות הכפר הערבי סורית, ראינו ריכוז גדול של, גם של אנשים וגם של כלי רכב. חכנו מעל השטח והבחנו באופן מוחלט במספר די גדול של אמבולנסים של הצבא הבריטי, שכנראה הובא למקום, והבנו שקרה משהו למחלקה. Piecing events together from the testimony of Arab witnesses, it seems that the platoon encountered two Arab women gathering wood at daybreak and decided to let them go. The women returned to their village and raised the alarm. Just a few miles from the Etzion block, Arab forces surrounded the 35 Jewish fighters. <laughs> ‫אני זוכר ששמענו ‫כמה יריות בודדות מרחוק מאוד, ‫שזה לא היה יוצא דופן. ‫תגבורת זאת באה מהכפרים. ‫את המחלקה הזו מסיבה כלשהי, ‫אולי מפני שדני נפגע ראשון. ‫בין הראשונים, המחלקה, המחלקה התפרקה ‫ליותר מקבוצה אחת. ‫הקרב נמצא משעות הבוקר ‫עד לשעה ארבע לפני חייו. ‫לרעת ארבע עד ‫בין ערב הנותרים עשרה אחת עשרה איש ‫ניסו לנטוש את הגבעה ‫ולשגת לכיוון הרטוס. ‫אולם בטרם הפסיקו לרדת, ‫נפגעו ונהרגו. ‫תקלו. ‫אחד השייחים, שייח אברהים קראו לו, ‫מג'אבה, שהוא בעצמו השתתף ‫בקרב נגד הלמדי. ‫אם נגזר עליי למות, הוא אומר, ‫אני מעדיף למות כמו שמתי גבוהים אלו. ‫למה? ‫מפני שגם כשנגמרה להם התחמושת, ‫הם עוד ניסו להגן על עצמם באבנים, ‫כי מצאו כמה הרוגים עם אבנים בידיים. ‫כשאנשים בריטיש פוליס סופרינטנדנט ‫הימש דוגן ‫הרחבו מהברון אחרי המטל, ‫הוא הגיע את ה-35 בודים ‫והביאו אותם לבריאל בכפר עציון. ‫הגיע דוג'ן לכפר עציון ‫ושאל את אנשי כפר עציון ‫אם הם מוכנים לקבור 35 גוויות ‫שנפלו בשטח. ‫שני חברים, שני חברי כפר עציון, ‫עולים על המכוניות, ‫רואים מה שמתרחש כאן, ‫אחד כמעט מתעלף, ‫יודעים למטה אנחנו, ‫לא בשביל הלב שלנו. ‫אז אמרתי, אני עולה. ‫לקחתי עוד חבר אחד, ואני אוריד אותם. ‫רק ביקשתי דבר אחד, ‫שיחוו את כל האורות, שיהיה חושך. ‫פירקנו את המשאית ‫וסידרנו את הגופות בבית הכנסת, ‫וניסינו, היו חלקים מפוזרים, ‫ידיים, רגליים. ראש אחד. הבינונו את מצבנו האמיתי. והבינונו מה צפוי לנו כשהם ינצחו אותנו. ראינו באיזה מצב הביאו אותנו. זאת אבל זה משהו היום בנורא. ‫כמעט כל הלילה ניסינו להתאים אותם, ‫ואחרי זה צריך להכין אותם להלוויה. ‫אז 
אנחנו קיבלנו רשות מהבריטים לנסוע להלוויה. אז נתנו לנו טנדרים, ובטנדרים אנחנו ישבנו על ארגזים. אבל הבריטים לא ידעו שבארגזים היה שם נשק וציוד בשביל הכוש. זה באופן לגלי העברנו את הדברים האלה. לאחר מכן יצא מסע הלוויה לבית הכפרות. עמדה כאן מחלקה של החברים שלהם מיחידות הפלמ"ח והחיש וירו אלומות אש. המחלקה הזאת, לולאה הייתה נהרגת, נרצחת. מתוכה היית מוצא ראש ממשלה, שר חוץ, ראש כנסת. רמטכ"ל, את הכל הייתה בקבוצה הזאת של 35 איש, אבדה נוראה. אמצעי מנוחה נכונה, אה, כנפי השכינה. במעלות קדושים, טהורים וגיבורים, כזו... לנשמות הקדושים שנלחמו בכל מערכות ישראל במחתרת ובצבא ההגנה לישראל שנפלו במלחמתם ומסרו נפשם על קדושת השם העם והעדב שאנו מתפללים לעילוי נשמותיהם. לכן בעל הרחמים יסתירם בסית אל כנפיו לעולמים. ויצרו בצרו החיים את נשמותיהם. אדוני הוא נחלתם. בגן עדן תראה מנוחתם. וינוחו בשלום על משכבם ויעמדו לכל ישראל לזכותם ויעמדו לגורלם לקץ הימים ונאמר אמן 
actually after the United Nations resolution in 1947, we remained alone. We were attacked by seven armies. We didn't have yet an army. We have had a war before we have had a state, before we have had an army. And even the countries that were for the establishment of a true state refused to provide us with arms, including the United States of America. They wouldn't give us rifles for our self-defense. We were alone, attacked, isolated, and uh, we're supposed to lose. All the odds were against us. The Mahalnik was initiated by the Mahalniks themselves. People young and able, well established, but still with a memory of the Shoah and the photos of the fighting Israel rose their conscience and they came in. Individually, risking many things. First of all, the American citizen ship was illegal at the time to do so. Secondly, there is their life. Thirdly, they came to an unknown country. And they came ready to do everything without any conditions. Their contribution was immense. In my senior year, the war broke out. Shock to everybody. I enlisted in the Navy. We served in the Pacific. There was an article that appeared in the Time magazine. It was an article about a man named Ziegelboim. Ziegelboim had been in the Warsaw Ghetto. Wife and children were still there, and they smuggled him out so he could come to the West to tell the, the, the Jews of the world, of America and Britain, what was going on inside the Warsaw Ghetto and of the killings, which the Germans took great pains to hide. He quickly became dis discouraged and despondent by their lack of attention and seriousness, and he went back to his room and committed suicide. That had a profound impact upon me. I kept, I cut the article out of the Time magazine right there in the room where it was lying on a table, and I kept it. At the end of the war, I was admitted to the Harvard Law School. We began to learn about the concentration camps, what really went on, and about the Jews trying to get out of Europe to get into Palestine. And I, by sheer chance, grew up in the United States, nurtured school, place to eat and sleep all the time, secure. And there was an imbalance here, a real imbalance. I had the good life and they had horror. It was an imbalance that had to be righted. I mean, we couldn't just sit in law school while this was going on. This was history being made. We didn't go back to our second year in law school, just didn't go back. We flew us down to Miami, the Palmach guys from New York where they took us dockside and there was this, this hulk. It was a uh, boat that didn't inspire confidence. We prepared our ship, which carried 20 officers and men. We prepared this ship so that it could accept and safely carry 1,500 people. We set out to the coast of Italy to pick up our Mapilim. In the middle of the night, the Mapilim coming from the shore, they came to the side of the ship. We had the Jacob's Ladder, rope ladders. These people, men, women, children, different ages, were not only obliged to climb up this difficult ladder to get aboard the ship, but it had to be done in a hurry. I was down below when an elderly gentleman came down the corridor, and I was urging him to get in, urging people to move, and, and he stopped me, and he said to me in Yiddish, he said, wait a minute, he said, I was once Bala Boss in my own house. Well, it, it struck me right in the heart. I mean, and I could imagine my father, who was a dignified man with his own family and boss in his own house, to be in this situation totally, totally devoid of any status and being pushed and ordered and shoved. And there but for the grace of God goes my father or goes me. And we were loaded and on our way. We're headed for Palestine. When you see human beings who have individual characteristics, they're not just concepts, they're real people. They're Jews, they're, they're like me, we're fellow Jews and what they've been through. It was a profound experience.
While some Americans, like Harold Katz, volunteered overseas, others sought ways to be of help in the United States. Many of the people who volunteered became well-known for their remarkable careers and contributions. Yet looking back on all his accomplishments, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, longtime president of Yeshiva University, called his involvement in 1948 one of the highlights of his life. The founding of the state in May 15, 1948, came right when I was going to college. We felt we have to do something. So I was a chemistry major. I did four years of chemistry in, in uh, yeshiva and one year in postgraduate work in Brooklyn Polytech. And I had the idea that maybe science students can do something more. So I picked up the phone and I called up the Jewish agency. As, as I don't know who I said. I said, I want to do something uh, of the nature of research or whatever we can do. In the middle of my talk, he stops me. He says, shut up and come over here immediately. I went to, not because of that kind of talk, but I was taken aback and I just did that. I shut up and I went down to see him and he apologized. He said, the reason I was so abrupt was our wires are tapped. It's none of the FBI's business what we're doing. I began mean, to understand the nature of the project. Israel had some guns, but they had no munitions and they wanted to be able to manufacture munitions bullets. So our mission was to develop a bullet from the material available to the uh, Jews in Israel uh, and to be able to get to them back to them on time. At one point there was an alarm and we all scrambled, took all our papers and chemicals, put them away and a whole set of other papers and chemicals. I looked about this whole thing very strange. Turns out the FBI was coming and we, our excuse was we we're doing research on, on um, uh, fertilizers. Uh, so they came and they left and of course they winked, you know. They knew what it was all about and we knew what it was all about, we weren't going to say anything. As soon as they left, everything went reverse. All the stuff about fertilizer went into the drawers and the stuff we're working on came out. Did we succeed? I think we did at the end. And we, we got the formula uh, and they were able to manufacture the bullets for the Davidka. Uh, which is something which we made us very happy and very pleased. It's, uh, one of the things that I regard as one of the highlights of my life because I was able to meet people whom I really respected because of their knowledge and um, realize that everything else is secondary to, to the real work that was being done. So I'm grateful for it. It initiated me into a different kind of pattern of existence. You, know, you have to do things sometimes, even if it's done uh, quietly, even if it's against the law, but there's a higher law we had to obey. Had to obey. And, it worked out, thank God. On a sweltering Sunday in July 1945, 20 men gathered in a penthouse apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. This group of successful Jewish businessmen from around the United States had come at the request of David Ben-Gurion and had been invited by Henry Monter, longtime UJA leader and founder of Israel Bonds. This cadre of industrial leaders known simply by their host's name, the Sonnenborn Institute, used their connections to raise money, recruit manpower, acquire weapons, army surplus, and even airplanes and aircraft carriers. Working in coordination with the Jewish Agency, this operation relied on a wide network of American volunteers to successfully smuggle weapons, machine parts, and uniforms to help the effort for Israel's War of Independence. Right after World War II, U.S. government decided that they overbought so much material that they have to get rid of it. They set prices on, like GI boot or airplanes. This $250,000 airplane you could buy for $5,000 and you're an extra i We'll give it the open account for 30 days. They only wanted veterans because you could yeah. get open account and billing, yeah went up to Stockton Naval Base, and we walked in and looked over in the corner, and here's a whole corner full of 30 caliber machine gun belts, just stacked up in the corner. So I said to the guy, what are you gonna do with that? He says, nobody's even looked at it. Who would want that kind of a thing? So I said, I think I got a guy. Would you sell it by the ton? And he said, I'll take whatever offer. We tried to put it up on seal bid. We never got a bid. We bought them. At any rate, how do, what do you do with them? And another man said, 
I know what to do with them. There's an independent canner out in Orange County. He's Gentile, but his partner's Jewish. And I'm sure that I can work out something with it. So I went out there with him with a whole box full of these belts. And he took the number 10 restaurant size cans and we saw how many belts we could cover in there. And his art department make up a ketchup label to put on the outside of the can and cartons that said ketchup on the outside. And he packaged all those for nothing. After the plant closed down, he came in, the two partners came in with a couple of machine operators and they did everything. Loaded it into a semi truck that should have carried X number of thousands of pounds. This weighed almost double that. But they had to disguise it like ketchup. And I rode in the semi truck with the driver and the assistant driver, knowing that we would only stop for gasoline and maybe food. We went from there out Route 66. We probably passed 20 states, 25 states from LA to Brooklyn. On the road, there's a, a little turnoff says all trucks over X number of tons have to pull in here and get weighed to make sure that you're not overweight. We had a four-door passenger car in front of us that we didn't know anything about at all. But every time we came to a weight station, the four-door passenger car would go through the weight station first and the lights would go out to the weight station. And then we'd just go on without it going over scale or anybody marking the license plate numbers on the truck. We passed probably 50 weight stations that turned their lights off, didn't even want to see us. We went into Brooklyn Harbor, the semi-truck drove straight down right to the dock, backed up, and they handled these cartons that weighed double what they were marked, about 60 pounds I'd say. They were marked 32 pounds or whatever, and they had three stevedores picking up these cartons and throwing them up a conveyor belt onto the, onto the ship, just like they weighed 30 pounds. I'm sure there's a dozen stories just like that, maybe more. On the eve of the exodus from Egypt and the birth of the Jewish nation, God injects an element of chipazum, haste, into the proceedings. He turns to the Israelites and he says, even though you have waited for centuries for this moment to arrive, and even though you will not actually leave Egypt until tomorrow, everything you do tonight has to be done in haste. There has to be a sense of urgency that informs all of your actions. And I believe that what God is teaching us at the dawn of our history is that there are points in life and points in history where one moment can change the world, where everything can change in an instant. And it becomes our responsibility to recognize those moments for what they are, to not let them pass us by, to meet the challenges they present and to seize the opportunities that they carry with them. You and I are about to re-experience one such moment right now. A moment that changed our world. 1947, Flushing, New York. The General Assembly of the United Nations is meeting to vote on the partition plan. To decide whether or not to divide the land of Palestine into separate Jewish and Arab states. Everything hangs in the balance. And I want us for a moment to forget about the fact that we know how it turns out. To set aside all that we know about the decades that have followed. The way that the state of Israel has met challenge after challenge. The tremendous accomplishments that have been made in such a short period of time within that state. Put it aside. 
Right now, just revisit the moment. Could it be? Could it be that after thousands of years, we will return to our home? Could it be that this will be the last time that someone else will determine our fate? Could it be that we Jews will break every expectation and every rule? That after thousands of years of persecution, that a few short years after the Shoah, we will return to our land? We will have our state for the first time in centuries. Watch as the vote unfolds. Experience the disappointment of every no vote and the joy every time you hear a yes. Experience the sense of anticipation as we count the votes and the rising excitement as it begins to become clear that you know what? We may win. It may happen. Dance in your minds with those who are dancing in the streets on your screen. Dance as you experience and recognize what it means to have a state for the first time in centuries to control our destiny. Relive that moment and then come back to our time. You see, sometimes we take things for granted. And there have been times, I'm sure, if you're anything like me, that you've taken the state of Israel for granted as well. But you won't. You won't if together with me you relive that moment and you recognize that it could have been different. That that moment was miraculous in nature. That as Rav Soloveitchik points out in Cold Odido Fake, there were multi-layers to the miracle, not the least of which was that the United States and Russia voted on the same side of an issue for the only time during the Cold War. And recognize that that moment changed our world, changed our people, and changed us. The minutes of Britain's mandate are ticking to an end, but the nations are still deliberating over the future of the Holy Land. Palestine in 1947 had reached its boiling point. Thirty years had passed since the Balfour Declaration announced Britain's support for a national home for the Jewish people. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish refugees, survivors of the horrors of the Shoah, were trying to make their way to Palestine, but Britain had shut the gates to immigration. The Jewish underground movements increased military actions to force the British out. The British were fed up and they had passed on the problem of the partition of Palestine to a United Nations committee in UNSCOPE who were deliberating. Nobody really believed in our day the UN was a place where you deliberated and deliberated. They never did anything, they talked a lot. The United Nations Committee recommended an end to the British mandate and the partition of Palestine into two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state, and scheduled a vote in the UN General Assembly at Lake Success, New York. A two-thirds majority was required to pass the proposal. Despite the support of both the United States and the Soviet Union, many other countries needed to be convinced. You spoke to the Belgian, and you spoke to the Swede, and you spoke to the Brazilian, preaching, uh, explaining why all the time. Uh, the refugees and the displaced people, they call them displaced person in Europe. There were a number of us working at the same time also on uh, getting votes. A preliminary vote showed the Jewish agency delegation coming up short. The diplomatic team focused their efforts on three countries that were still undecided, Liberia, Haiti, and the Philippines. שהבטיח לו להצביע בעד, והנה מתברר שהשגריר שלהם בלייק סקסס לא קיבל הוראה. מצאנו אותו, זה היה כבר מאוחר בלילה, התחלנו להסביר לו שהנשיא לא עמד בדיבורו, והיה שקט, אז התחלנו לשאול מה קרה, אז הוא אומר, תשמע, אני חושב, I'm thinking. 
מה, מה אתה חושב עכשיו בשלוש בבוקר? הוא אומר, אני חושב, איזה שעה עכשיו בפיליפינים? ובסוף הייתה שיחה עם נשיא הפיליפינים, והוא הובטח שהשגריר שלו יקבל הוראה. It was touch and go all the time till you got everything lined up. Haiti of all countries was the last country come to vote. We sent down to Haiti a Protestant minister by the name of Sheldon, who was also believed that the Jews should have a homeland. He, they went down for two or three days, and on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, they came back and they said, Haiti will vote with us. Some people promised and voted against. Some people were pursued by us till the last minute and voted for. Diplomacy continued up until the vote itself was held. And there was a South American country, I don't want to tell you which, so our head of the Latin group, an Argentinian Jew, who was in the Mishlacha, he went to the men's room and he recognized the men's shoes under the door. And he knocked and he said, you promised to vote, they are voting now. I'm coming, I'm here to bring you to the voting. And he voted. This was Saturday night. So somebody explained it can't be Friday night because uh, in Mashiach, Babi Shabbat. Of course, we huddled around the radio, which was only a battery radio, and kept conking out. All the shulchan and the safsalim in the radio, we were shocking on the shulchan, the dead from the evil. There were two days without a night, there was a war in the end. Jews throughout the world held their breath in anticipation. Those who are in favor will say yes, those who are against will say no. And the abstainers always, they, they know what to say. They went through the vote. We're going to stop them now. Afghanistan. We were keeping score. No. Argentina. On, on a radio in, in the office. And I remember a lot of the colors. Guatemala, yes. Argentina, abstention. Lebanon, no. no. Yugoslavia and Spain, United Kingdom and Spain. When we came to OTP, the Philippines, they said yes, we did something, we did something. United States, yes. But, ah! Yes. Plus, negative. Minus. Venezuela, yes. I remember the excitement. This was our life. Man, yes. At one point, we made it. The resolution of the Death Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. After the vote, people were crying, people were embracing. ואז יצאו כולם ויצאנו כולנו לרחבה המרכזית של העיר. And we said, now let's go into town. So we got a lift on the back of a British armored carrier with a gun. <laughs> But we're now we're all pals. We sat in the car, Charette, my husband and myself, from Lake Success to Manhattan, and nobody said a word. was overpowering. Every 
everybody was screaming towards the Jewish agency. The government in waiting of the state to be, headed by David Ben Gurion. I have a picture of myself on the roof of the uh, Sochlut building. I don't know how I got there. I had the biggest single horror dance I've ever seen in my life was that dance around that courtyard. Ben Gurion, standing on the balcony of the Sochnut building, the heart of Jerusalem, and he raised his hand, and utter silence waited for his words. He called it the Hebrew state because it had no name, and asked everyone to sing Hatikva. Well, as for these 20 centuries, we Jews were always the object of history, that is, an object where others made the decisions for us. As of that date onwards, we suddenly become again the subject of history, where we make the decisions for ourselves. There you are sitting, and there your country was forming itself as a country. I remember the moment. Something is now about to happen. The dream of 2,000 years, maybe. I mean, that's when we started imagining what might be. In the years leading up to Israel's founding, American Jews found themselves in a unique position to help. They were the Jewish community that was most intact after the Holocaust. They had the affluence and influence, the know-how and connections to play a key role in creating the state. People like I.E. Millstone and Ed Levy used their expertise to provide housing for the wave of new immigrants coming to the state. American lawyer and future federal judge William Herlands answered Ben Gurion's request to set up a legal system for the new state. But sometimes it wasn't what you knew, but who you knew that changed the course of Jewish history. Uncle Dewey was always larger than life. <laughs> That's just how he, he came across. I think when he was 40, that was when he met Weitzman. He really worshiped him. Dewey was being honored one night at a B'nai B'rith dinner, and Dewey said, I don't know what to do. Weitzman has to meet Truman. Truman won't see him. I don't know who to call to enable Weitzman to get in to see Harry Truman. I gave orders that nobody, nobody, was to come to see me and talk about the Palestine affair. Dr. Cham Weitzman had been trying to get in all along, and I wouldn't let him in. Eddie Jacobson, Truman's partner, in the haberdashery store was honored at a B'nai B'rith dinner. Let's give him a call and see if we can't get him to ask Truman to see Weizmann. So they went around collecting quarters and dimes and nickels to put into the payphone to call Eddie Jacobson to see if he would intervene with, White, with Truman. And they went outside and they made a call to Eddie Jacobson. And Dewey clued him in as to who Chaim Weizmann was and how important it was for Chaim Weitzman to get to see Truman. Jacobson agreed, and Jacobson went to Truman. He came in, he stood around, didn't say very much, was as quiet as he could be, and I finally said, Eddie, what in the world's the matter with you? Have you at last come to get something? Well, because you never have asked me for anything since I've been in the White House and since we've been friends. And then he told me that he thought not to keep Dr. Weitzman out of the White House. He thought I ought to see him. And I told him that I would see the doctor, but he'd have to bring him into the side door. I didn't want any propaganda started on the thing. And so Chaim Weitzman came in the side door, and Truman fell in love with him. Dr. Weitzman's first name was C-H-A-I-M. And I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I called him Cham called him that to his face and he liked it. He was a wonderful man, one of the wisest people I think I ever met. He was a leader, one of the kind that you read about and seldom see. We had a long, long conversation. 
and he explained the situation from his viewpoint. And I listened to him very carefully. And at the same time, I sent for Ada Jacobson and they both sat down and talked to me for a long, long time. When we were through, I said, all right, you two Jews have put it over on me and I'm glad you have for I like you both. So that's how Weitzman got to see Truman and Truman gave him his word that he would recognize the state of Israel. But in spite of all the advice against it, I chose to recognize the de facto government of Israel. This was done on the 15th of May, 1948. I felt that we were rather the conscience of the free world. The miraculous story of Israel's founding is best told by the individual men and women who lived during this extraordinary era. On Yom HaZikaron and Yom Ha'atzma'ut, we honor their sacrifice and contribution. Toldo Israel is privileged to have recorded so many of the personal and powerful accounts of Israel's founding generation. You can find many more films and interview excerpts on our website or YouTube channel. Please join us for the singing of Hatikva. Chag Sameach!